The human brain is an incredibly complex dynamic system made up of vast overlapping neural networks. These neural networks together give rise to everything from blood pressure control to monitoring heart rate to thought and emotion. In order to understand something as complex as that, it's important to start small. In this chapter, we start small by considering the cells that make up those neural networks. From the outset, it's worth pointing out that the brain consists of two broad classes of cells, neurons and glia. In this chapter, we'll focus exclusively on neurons, but it's worth pointing out that glia actually outnumber neurons 50 to 1 in the brain, and they do play an important but less understood role in information processing. That said, we'll focus on neurons. Specifically, we'll focus on their structure and on their function, that is, how they communicate. To begin, let's start with a definition. A neuron is a specialized cell that's capable of sending and receiving information. This last part is important. Neurons handle information to, within, and from the brain. That's a lot of information. So it's not surprising that you have a lot of neurons, you know, upwards of 200 billion. In addition to the sheer number of neurons, your brain has a lot of different types of neurons upwards of 10,000 different types depending on how you classify them. This isn't surprising either given the wide range of different kinds of information that you have to process. Everything from sensations, uh, emotions, and thought, for example. Now, we're going to talk about the structure of a neuron, but it's worth mentioning that as late as the 19th century, most scientists didn't believe that the brain was made up of discrete cells. In fact, the prevailing opinion of the time was that the brain was better conceptualized as one gigantic interconnected network, a web if you will. This view is perhaps not that surprising given the technology of the time. When you looked at that brain, it did kind of look like one jumbled mess, a web. It was the pioneering work of Santiago Ramón y Cajal that showed us that in fact the brain did consist of discrete cells, which he called neurons. Now, the way he discovered this is a kind of interesting story. He actually used a staining method developed by his arch rival, Golgi. The funny thing about this staining method is that it randomly stains only a very, very small percentage of neurons. So for Golgi, who didn't believe in discrete cell theory of the brain, this was kind of a failure. You know, he was trying to stain the whole network. But on the other hand, for Ramon y Cajal, it was basically a godsend because the brain was such a jumbled mess that if it wasn't for the fact that it only stained such a small number of them, he wouldn't have been able to separate those cells at all. But lucky for us, he was able to. Now, not only was Ramon y Cajal able to show us that neurons did exist as discrete cells, he went further. He showed that neurons had several identifiable parts in common. So let's talk about what those parts are. Like all other cells, neurons have a cell body. The cell body is in fact the largest part of a neuron, and it contains the nucleus, you know, DNA, and it's involved in really essential things like protein synthesis. But as important as the cell body is, what we care about in this chapter are the parts that allow the neuron to receive and send information. The first part are called dendrites. These are branch-like structures that come out of the cell body and collect incoming signals. The second part is called the axon. This is a fiber bundle that carries signals away from the cell body. Now, it's important to point out that while a neuron may have many dendrites, it only has one axon. The axon may branch at the end, but it's still only one signal. Most axons are wrapped in a fatty insulation called myelin. The myelin allows axons to send information at a much faster rate than it could otherwise. The final part that's important to consider are terminals. These exist at the very end of those axon branches, and they house neurotransmitters, 
which are the chemical signal used to communicate between neurons. Okay, so now we have a basic sense for the structure of neurons. But how do they function? That is, how do they communicate? It turns out that neurons have evolved unique capabilities for communication both within a neuron and between neurons. Within a neuron, communication is entirely electrical. Between neurons, communication can be electrical or chemical, but it's mainly chemical. Let's start by considering communication within a neuron. A simplified version of this process goes something like this. The dendrites capture information coming from other neurons and pass it to the cell body. The cell body integrates those signals into one unified signal. Now, if that signal reaches a particular threshold, then the cell body will initiate its own electrical signal to pass down the axon. This signal is called an action potential. If the signal in the cell body does not reach the threshold, then no action potential will be initiated. In this way, communication within a neuron is considered all or nothing. Either the action potential is triggered or it is not. There is no in-between. Let's assume that the action potential was initiated and the signals pass down the axon until it arrives at the axon terminals. This is essentially where we go from communication within a neuron to communication between neurons. In reality, a neuron is going to be connected to thousands of other neurons. But for our purposes, let's keep it simple. Let's ask this question. How does neuron A communicate with neuron B? It turns out to answer that question, we have to appreciate that neurons do not indiscriminately communicate with other neurons. In fact, they mainly communicate at very specialized locations called synapses. In this case, we're talking about a synapse between the axon terminal of neuron A and the dendrite of neuron B. It turns out in the human brain, there are two types of synapses, electrical and chemical. Now, as late as the 19th century, most scientists believed that the brain only had electrical synapses. This is not that surprising given that the brain is incredibly fast in the way that it handles information. So it was thought that anything other than electrical synapses would simply be too slow for the kinds of information the brain has to process and the speed with which it has to process it. The idea that something other than electrical synapses was at play in neuronal communication was given a boost with the discovery of what is called the synaptic cleft. This is a very small gap between the terminal of neuron A and the dendrite of neuron B. Now, I say it's small and I mean it's very small, maybe a few billionths of a meter wide. But it's just big enough to act as a short to the electrical circuit. That is, that electrical signal coming down the axon of neuron A to its terminal cannot jump to the dendrite of neuron B. So, with the discovery of the synaptic cleft, it became clear that something else had to be going on. And in this case, that something else is chemical. Specifically, the brain has very specialized chemicals called neurotransmitters that it uses to bridge that gap between the terminal of neuron A and the dendrite of neuron B. And in the human brain, we have over 100 different neurotransmitters, and that allows us all kinds of complex signaling. But just having neurotransmitters doesn't tell us how it is we can go from electrical signaling in neuron A to chemical signaling between neuron A and neuron B to electrical signaling again in neuron B. So let's consider that process for a moment. Okay. We have electrical communication within a neuron, that is, between dendrites and axon terminals. And we have electrical and chemical communication between neurons. 
But it's worth asking, why even have chemical communication at all? Why not just rely on the efficiency and speed that comes with electrical to electrical signaling? And in fact, remember, the brain does have electrical synapses. But these synapses tend to be relegated to areas where speed matters more than anything else. So areas like reflexes. It turns out that chemical communication is absolutely critical for all kinds of complex behaviors that we consider human. That is, any kind of flexible, adaptive behavior, including learning, depends fundamentally on chemical signaling and on neurotransmitters. In this way, the brain has really struck an optimal balance between the electrical synapses and their speed and efficiency, and chemical synapses that bring with it the flexibility and adaptability to respond to your environment. Okay, to summarize, in this chapter, we introduced the idea of a neuron, which is the fundamental building block of the brain. Specifically, we talked about the structure of a neuron and introduced several key parts, including dendrites, the cell body, the axon, the myelinated sheath around an axon, and the axon terminals. And we also discussed how neurons function, that is, how they communicate. And we made a distinction there between communication within a neuron, which is through electrical signaling, and communication between neurons, which can either be electrical or chemical in nature. And in the case of chemical signaling, we discussed how the brain makes use of specific chemicals called neurotransmitters. In future chapters, we'll build on this understanding to consider the structure and function of the brain as a whole.